Okay, hello everyone. Welcome back to Lunch with the Experts, a Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Tercera Therapeutics. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host and I am always your host every week. And if you follow the show, you may notice that I am not in my current home office like I normally am. So I am currently at the Music City Center in Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm speaking later today, and they were kind enough to give me a conference room so that we could still bring you the show. We bring it rain, sleet, snow, whatever, right? Wherever I am in the world, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you the show. So uh, that is why you see a different background here today. And if you're new to the show, hey, welcome. This is just like every other week. Uh, either way, if you're new to the show or if you're a regular or friend of the foundation, uh, I want you to start off by saying hello to everybody, telling us where you are in the world. I'm tuning in from Nashville, Tennessee today, right in the heart of downtown. Tell us where you are uh, signing on from in the world. You know, my favorite thing about this show, one of my many favorite things, is the reach that we have. Every week we have people from all over the world tuning live, right? Okay, if you're in Eastern time and it's noon or Central time and it's 11, that's one thing. If you're in South Africa and, and India and Australia, it's a lot of different uh, different times you may be in, different time zones. You may, uh, should be asleep, <laughs> but you're tuning into the show and that tells me, hey, we're doing a great job. So that makes me very happy. Uh, let us know, say hello to everybody in, in the comments section. We build a community here as well. So the, the stories you share with each other is just as important as the Im information from the guest. Before we get started, we always like to thank our presenting sponsor tercera therapeutics we could not do this program without them and we have this little disclaimer that we like to include from them and that is that the opinions expressed by the guest presenters as well as the questions asked by the audience at home that you all haven't been created or suggested by the sponsors of lunch with the experts and ccf doesn't endorse or promote any of the views opinions or information provided in the presentation audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guest and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. Now that last line is really the takeaway I want you to, to focus on. We're going to give you some good advice. We're going to answer some of your questions, but by no means do we know your specific case. So take that advice, take those answers, take that information back to your home team, which does know your specific case and make the best plan for you moving forward. As we all know, this case, this is a case by case disease. Each case is unique, right? And each path is unique. So we hope that we answer some of your questions and to help us do our job better, we can't really answer super case specific questions, right? So we'll have to ask those questions in kind of generic terms so that we can still educate you and, and help you further down that path. But if you just start giving us all these things where our guest is going to really have to be your doctor to help you, that's not going to help us do our job, okay? So uh, I'm delighted to welcome our guest back today. We had him very recently, in fact, just a month or so ago. Uh, but by popular demand, we had so many questions that day that we didn't get close to answering them all. So he was gracious enough to come back, folks. Welcome to the stage. Dr. Thomas Odoricio. How are you, Dr. Odoricio? Doing well, and thank you very much uh, for having me back. I really appreciate it, and I'm uh, uh, eager, to, eager to answer questions and to share, you know, some uh, more recent uh, information on the PRT as it comes up, and okay. I'm, I'm ready to go. All right. That sounds good. You always are. And I appreciate you be, uh, being back on the show and being so willing. I'm sure that the people do too. Let's see where everybody is. New York, Wilmington, North Carolina, Suzanne. I'm from Durham. That's good to see you. Chicagoland, SoCal, all over the state. Suzanne, you are awesome. Uh, we've got some Canada in the house. A couple of people from Arizona. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you. Welcome back, Dorothy says, to Doc O that he is affectionately known as Doc Odo, rather. Right, yeah, uh, that's, what you, that's what you told us. That's what you told Thank us last. You. He said, "I'll take it." <laughs> yep, uh, Doc Odo is the best. All right, everybody. So here's what we're gonna do. Go ahead and start sending in your questions because we know you're gonna have a lot of them with Doctor Doctor Odoricio because we did last time. I expect the same type of result. Okay, start sending them in. If we don't get to your question, if you have a follow up question, I urge you. I say this every every week, and I really mean it. I urge you to reach out to send a private message to CCF, either here on the Facebook page where you already are, or you can message them at their website carsonoid.org. You can email them and ask them the, the, them the question. They'll get you the information that you need, or they'll get you the information of the person who can help you 
get that uh, answer to your question. So definitely do that. You can always watch this show again because we're going to cover a lot of ground. We're gonna, it's going to live here on the Facebook page. It will be evergreen right under the videos tab. Starting Monday, we will republish it to YouTube for those people you know don't have Facebook. But you can always watch it again. But the real value is going to be from this one-on-one -on -one interactive, virtual interactive session that you have with our expert, with Dr. Odoricio. So that's the benefit. If you know someone out there, this could be a caregiver, support group leader, obviously a patient that would benefit from this one-on-one -on -one session, here's what I want you to do. I want you to tag them in the comments. You can also share uh, this video to their Facebook page. If you know them personally, you can text them. Email might take too long. Shoot them a DM on Instagram, whatever you have to do. Our goal is to try to get as many people here as possible so they can answer as many questions as possible. Do that for me. I would appreciate it. And the second ask, I'm sorry to ask for so much, but this is essentially to help me serve you. If you see a question in the side uh, panel in the comments section, that you also have, or you're also interested in the answer to, just like that, love it. Any of the little emojis right under the comment, it says like, reply, um, just uh, like or love that comment, any, any emoji that Facebook gives you the option to, and they all work effectively the same way for me, and that is to upvote that, that question so I know there's a demand for it, okay? If I see that seven people have asked that question, I'm gonna make sure to get that question across to Dr. Odorisi, okay? Thank you for that. That really helps me do my job. Finally, before we get started, I have a special announcement today. This is really cool. And I talked a little bit earlier about the reach of the program and how many countries and continents this program reaches and how just awesome I think that is and how fulfilling that is for someone who's helping get this program out to the world. And we always have people in attendance from South Africa, which is really cool. Well, there's exciting news from our friends who join us from Africa. And there is a new online neuroendocrine tumor Southern Africa support group called NETSAS, you know, Neuroendocrine Tumor South African Support for net patients and loved ones from South Africa and every country in Africa. Uh, and the group will be meeting once a month by Zoom. And we are going to share a link to you uh, so you can have more information. We'll share that in the comment section. And uh, that being said, if there's anything else that Dr. Odoricio refers to today, a medication, a, a resource, an article, anything like that, uh, we'll try to put that in the comment section as well via a link so that you don't have to jump out of you know, the Facebook page and open a Google browser window and try to search for it yourself. We'll do all that work for you. Okay, well, welcome to the show, everybody. This is Luncheon with the Experts with our guest, Dr. Thomas Odoricio. We appreciate you being here. So Dr. Odoricio, we were talking before we got on, you had, you had mentioned this, alluded to this in your, in your intro, What's going on with, with PRRT? I already see some questions coming, coming on about it. I know people have uh, lots of questions about this topic, but uh, there's a new clinical trial that's going on. What, is, what were we talking about before we started? Yeah, th th yeah thank you very much, uh, Rain. Uh, yes, there is uh, a lot of work, obviously with the FDA approval in the United States, uh, there's a, you know, a, a very uh, rapidly uh, growing experience with the BRT, which stands for peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. And the uh, isotope, the radioactive material is uh, 177 lutetium uh, right now. Uh, they've uh, historically done, uh, and we've done a lot of work at the University of Iowa with the uh, 90 yttrium or yttrium 90, however you prefer it, um, PRT, and uh, it's it's been uh, very uh, well received and very uh, uh, low risk, very low risk ben uh, compared to the benefit for it. But as as we go, and there's a protocol now, there's a clinical trial, and that's under Dr. Sue Odoricio at Iowa, and I don't know the other two. Uh, pediatric centers, but uh, she has um, a trial going now with the uh, uh, 177 lutetium uh, uh, Dota Tate. The uh, the carrier is Dota Tate, and it's uh, it's for uh, uh, children and adolescents. So they're hopefully they're going to strive for an FDA approval formally for for the children and adolescents with this with this unique study. Also being done as we speak, all of us, 
chat uh, is uh, the lead uh, 212. Now, uh, lead is a different kind of energy. So it's lead dash PRT because the isotope, instead of being lutetium 177, is lead 212. Mm. And in Germany right now, and probably other centers, but I know Germany, Bad Berka, where um, uh, uh, the, where a lot of PRT started besides Switzerland, um, and that was Richard Baum, who has recently left Bad Berka, but has uh, left a, a wonderful program. They're using actinium-225 uh, instead of the lead. Now, both of those isotopes, if you will, are alpha energy. So if you think about lutetium, mm -hmm. lutetium travels in the tissue about three millimeters. Uh, this is uh, uh, the alpha energy travels in terms of microns, very, very short distance. So what it does is when you, when you, you still need your receptors for somatostatin receptor two, but when it attaches, it goes into the cell, goes right up face to face with the nucleus and imparts a very powerful energy and destroys the, uh, the uh, DNA. Uh, and then you have gradual death of the cell. So it never leaves the cell that it attacks. So there is no friendly damage to speak of. There are, uh, it has to clear just like the lutetium did and the yttrium did through the kidney. So that, that's also an organ limiting uh, situation where they're still using uh, protection, cytoprotection for the kidney. Uh, and the, as the marrow goes, uh, they're studying that now and making sure that it doesn't have, you know, uh, some toxicity when it binds because it, when it physically binds and there are receptors in the marrow that, that has to be taken into consideration. So the alpha energy is coming, uh, I think, Eventually, there'll be the lutetium treatments. And then uh, if you recur or it comes back a little faster, uh, the, the lead hopefully will be offered or the actinium-225 as a regular FDA approved. Right now, it's in clinical trials. The other, oh. yeah, and the, only, uh, the other one is uh, there's some talk on, on a Zedra. A Zedra is a highly specific um, isotope, iodine-131. Uh, that carrier is a different carrier and it doesn't bind to somatostatin receptors. It binds to a different receptor on the neuroendocrine cell, mm. uh, uh, which is uh, a, a, a part of the adrenaline system. So uh, that's really been uh, tried in, in works in both paraganglioneuroma and pheochromocytoma and it. a few small bowel ones because they too will have that receptor as well as the somatostat receptor. And now, and that was called a Zedra? A Zedra, A-Z-E-D-R-A. Okay. That is the FDA approved form of I-131 therapy. Uh, they, uh, it, it was developed actually a long time ago in Mi University of Michigan, but they had never really gone forward with studies for the approval. Mm -hmm. uh, progenica, uh, Joe, progenica, progenica, I believe, progenics, pardon me, uh, uh, assumed the license and has uh, developed it. It's a unique form of radioactive I-131 because there's one radioactivity molecule mm -hmm. for the one carrier. So it's high, that's considered very high sp specific activity uh, as opposed to others which had some uh, uh, a little more of a contamination with cold I-131. So uh, with, that is to say unlabeled, which may be good or may be bad when it's mm -hmm. uh, therapeutically. But this is, is uh, also in clinical trials, but has been approved uh, for the F uh, by the FDA for uh, use mm -hmm. in, mal in malignant pheo and paraganglioneuroma.
Got it. Folks, if you are just joining us or joining us late, this is Luncheon with the Experts, a Carson and Cancer Foundation program. And today we are here with our guest, Dr. Thomas Odoricio, known by his patients as Doc Odo. And we've got uh, over 100 people in the room already, which happened fast. That's kind of a benchmark we like to see. That also means we're going to have a lot of questions. So we're going to go ahead and start taking some of those questions now. So I appreciate you being here. Let's get to the audience. So uh, first question comes from Skip, who is a top fan of the foundation. And uh, listen, we've already talked about PRT a lot, and, and I think there's going to be a lot of questions, uh, Dr. Odoricio. And we'll start with Skip, who says, why is PRRT not effective for tumors in the mesentery, if that is indeed the case? Uh, well, thank you for the question. It, it is effective. Okay. Uh, it, you know, if the tumors have... Um, uh, the receptor, obviously, that's the mechanism right now. The one PRT form that's FDA approved, it has to assumes that uh, the tumor uh, uh, maintains its somatostatin subtype receptor number two, and about 90 to 92 percent of neuroendocrine tumors can retain their receptor. Now, in terms of when you say effective, it's a good question because you're talking about durability or uh, you know, stability for the most part, because PRT stabilizes the tumors from growing. And that's the data. And, and I think lead is going to show the lead PRT with the same mechanism is going to show more uh, the true shrinkage of the tumors because of its action directly on the cell. But if you, you're comparing the small bowel tumors, and you're I believe you're talking about the most common, and that's the ileal, thus the ileal carcinoid or the small bowel carcinoid. Obviously, they can be tumors in the ileum. They can be tumors in the colon. Now, you may be referring to the neuroendocrine tumors much rarer in the large bowel, and you are correct. That is not quite as effective on those, and that may have to do with the number of uh, receptors that are contained in the tumors in the large bowel, the colon. But certainly um, the small bowel tumors in the ileum and jejunum and even the duodenum maintain okay. their receptors and, and the response is usually uh, a very good response. And especially when with the first treatment or the second treatment, the symptoms of carcinoid abate that predicts a longer duration of response. And uh, that's been shown well by, I, I actually our group did that in the, about 2010 and the Krenning group brought it forward with the, um, I think one of their people actually got a doctorate uh, doing the work with, um, with the symptom, the implications of symptom improvement. Got it, thanks if for that your That answers it for you. Yeah, thanks Skip. Uh, Ursula says, had my fourth round of PRRT today and a lot of shrinkage feeling blessed. Glad Very to hear good. that, Ursula. Very yeah. Good. And aren't you, Ursula, aren't you from South Africa? Do I remember that correctly? Uh, a few people from Tennessee, Paula from Chattanooga. I will be there next month. So, hey, everybody, I'm in Tennessee today as well. Um, okay, question from Mitchell. Mitchell says, my father passed away from carcinoid cancer about 20 years ago. Sorry to hear that, Mitchell. Even 20 years, it still hurts. I, I know how that feels. Uh, he was diagnosed by Dr. Warner uh, at Mount Sinai, and my dad was in his 69s when diagnosed. I am now 61. Is there any testing or screening I should do? Now, this is a common concern with people. Is this, does yeah. this have a genetic component? Should there be testing that I should do if someone in my family uh, had and passed away from carcinoid cancer? Well, it's a great question, and uh, and I'm uh, I'm assuming that his uh, neuroendocrine tumor was in the small bowel and it metastasized. Um, for the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, there there is there is probably good, very good evidence that uh, that can be a hereditary. Uh, and there's a syndrome called multiple endocrine neoplasia type one. I, we talked about it briefly last time, and that's particularly concerns neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas, where there is a, uh, a genetic uh, ca a carriage or passage, uh, a autosomal dominant type of thing, which can carry uh, about a 50% risk for the family, but not so with the small bowel. That's the enigmatic one. 
Mm. And it's always interesting to me that the term for neuroendocrine tumors used to be carcinoid, which is a German word, which means cancer-like. Right. And it was predicated on the small bowel tumors. The papers originally were that. And so it's that benign looking behavior and then the metastatic. Uh, in answer to your question, I have found that probably the best uh, physical test that you could get is is a uh, serotonin level, which is widely available in the United States commercially, especially if you're having symptoms that might be compatible with a small bowel tumor. And I would probably as well get a chromogranin A. Your doctor should, uh, uh, you, with telling them that uh, they should uh, order a, a chromogranin A for you, uh, we're particularly, uh, uh, positive for the pancreastatin, which is a piece of chromogranin A, but I think a serotonin and chromogranin A uh, would be very helpful for you. And, and uh, just a history of your symptoms. Uh, it, it, as That's how I would follow it. And I always recommend the serotonin for the small bowel because the, the, almost 100% of the small bowel tumors make serotonin sometime in their, in their progress as they get a little bit larger. Thanks, Mitchell. I hope that helps. And and yeah, if it was 20 years ago, car, you know, carcinoid cancer probably still was the the uh, common ex it, it common it expression at the was time. Before yeah. the w World Health Organization re mm -hmm. and uh, Solchia was responsible for the more uh, proper, mm -hmm. you know, identification Which, and characterization. Right. And our foundation was founded by Dr. Richard Warner. So, yeah. you know, that's yeah, where that, that name came from. Uh, okay. Moving on. Okay. Debbie, uh, also Debbie says my husband passed away in June. I'm so sorry to hear that Debbie. Uh, they said that his mitral valve needed, uh, needed replaced, but none of the surgeons in Iowa or Mayo would, uh, would replace it. He started retaining fluids last January. He had tricuspid and aortic valves replaced two and a half years ago. Why would they not replace replace it? His heart finally gave out uh, because of diuretics, quit working. Can't understand why they wouldn't replace his mitral valve back in January. Is it mitral or mitral? Am I pronounced that? Uh, my, mitral is mitral, usually, yeah, yeah. but I understood. Quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought, I thought so. As I said, I was like, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> you know, uh, that that may have a lot to do with his uh, cardiac function at the time. You know, there's a point of where, uh, you know, where the damage is so chronic. And, and, and like you said, he was having symptomatic uh, shortness of breath and fluid collection, that it might have been a, a greater risk to try the surgery. So, you know, I, I learned that from Dr. Howe, our neuroendocrine surgeon, that, you know, it's not just the procedure itself, but it's the uh, judgment around the condition of the patient. And it, it just might have been, uh, I, I can't say for sure without more information, but it could easily have been because of the uh, the damage suffered uh, along the way. Clearly, the right uh, the valves were uh, on the right side were the ones most likely involved uh, by the carcinoid, and rarely you get mitral valve involvement if there's a hole, a, a natural hole between the upper chambers where the right side then goes to the left side and and can carry serotonin or lung carcinoids can also damage the mitral valve. But in general, the mitral valve is not uh, routinely associated with heart disease from carcinoid, as you probably know. Uh, but it might've been his, his underlying condition at the time. I'm just, just thinking that, in which case it might've been a greater risk than benefit. Yeah, thanks for your question, Debbie, and, yes, and, and sending you some love. Next question from Julie, grade two, stage four SI primary with Mets to liver, mesentery, and pelvis. I feel great after 2020 debulking and, and monthly sandostatin shots. Last scan showed small spot on T7 of my spine. If sandostatin does not help, what types of things can I expect going forward? And I like this question, what questions should I be asking, Julie says. So th that's an excellent question, Julie. And um, uh, the, the, meta the OSHA's involvement uh, 
is does not uh, you know, some say that the Asha's involvement, uh, you know, may be associated with uh, earlier decline and what have you. But in the case of Asha's involvement, th they do what they call spot welding, uh, external radiation, especially if it becomes symptomatic. In general, I used to preach, and I still do, that, you know, your carcinoid comes to live with you. I mean, it's part of you. And so uh, if you look at your wonderful liver, it's probably you may have tumor in it, but I don't think your liver function tests are changing. And the, the same obtains for, for bone. If you put the, if the tumor goes to the bone, you rarely have fractures, pathologic fractures. There's a small percent that do, but for the most part, they're just there. And they're seen or can be seen by a scan, a gallium scan. But if they become symptomatic or too numerous, they do, and radiation oncology does this spot, uh, spot radiation, which doesn't really pick up a, a, you know, a, a history of a lot of radiation because spot radiation is very focused, very, very precise, and uh, it, it works very well, I would say. So, and the bone is always a tricky one because, you know, you think of blood supply to it and what have you, but, um, but uh, we, we routinely, and it's usually the axial skeleton, which is the vertebra, it involves the central, central skeleton, and uh, they can certainly follow them. But in general, you know, you just treat what, uh, what you need. Like you said, embolization or reductive surgery on your liver has worked wonderful, and I think that's a great way to go because the one organ you want to save forever is your liver. All right, thanks for your question. Yes, uh, indeed, thank yeah, you. Absolutely, and next question from Pat, friend of the foundation and a previous guest on Lunch with the Experts. Uh, Pat says, when planning to get a vaccine booster shot, should it be scheduled before or after the somatostatin analog injection? Well, that's a, a great question. In general, uh, there's no, there's no interference, if you will. Okay. Uh, I think, though, uh, keeping, uh, keeping regularity on your injection is probably very important, which you'll do, you know, as you go forward and get your booster. Uh, if you're taking oct uh, octreotide LAR, uh, certainly any time after 24 to 48 hours after your main shot would be fine. Um, if you're taking the lanreotide, uh, would not do it the day of the shot because that's when your level is climbing to its highest level. Lanreotide works immediately with the shot. It goes up to its highest level and then stays in a square wave, plateaus to a, square, uh, a high level for almost 30 days. And in fact, actually stacks. It comes out of tissue at the end of 30 days. But in general, just I would say 24 to 48 hours after the event, after the shot, would be fine, or before you know, before the shot. But if, as far as I know, there is absolutely no interference with immunizations or vaccines. Got it. Thanks, good Pat. Good question, though. Very good question. Yeah, a lot of people have have that question as well. So appreciate it, Pat, and, and good to see your your name. Um, and folks at home, I got to say, you're doing a really great job of the liking of the questions that you also have. This makes my job way easier because what I, another thing I love about the show is you all have your own conversations over there in the, in the comment section. That's great. We want that type of community. Um, but you know, there's a lot of comments and questions I'm filtering through. And so when you're talking to each other is one thing, but when I see seven people have a question, you know, it helps me do my job. And another thing you're doing which I want to encourage is if you hover down at the bottom of your Zoom window, I mean your Facebook window rather, apologies, I'm on Zoom, uh, then you'll see if you just hover there, you'll, you'll see a, a line of emojis will pop up. There's a like, a love, a support where you're hugging a heart and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, those are really good visual cues that if you're getting good information, and if you like something Dr. Odoricio said, just hit one of those and I'll see a little thumbs up or a heart go by and I'll know that that was a good question and a, or a good answer rather that you all got. Okay, let's keep it going with a question from Karen. Karen says, since my diagnosis in March 2019, my platelet count has been falling every month. Is there a connection with our injections uh, that would cause this? Thank you. 
So that, that's that's an excellent and a, as usual a, a difficult question. <laughs> I'm finding more and more having done this for so long, mm -hmm. and the ante always goes higher and higher with the with the community. I can say that. Um, it it is possible if you go back to the original literature uh, on somatostatin. You know the natural peptide. They made you know thousands of ounces of that. Uh, uh, before octreotide replaced it in, in the late 1980s, um, there were ex uh, some ex there were some studies where they gave a massive amount of somatostatin, and I believe it also happened with octreotide early on, and uh, there was an occasional uh, drop in platelets. I and the the, the animal that they, they studied was the I think the 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 monkey if I recall correctly, but it's very, very rare. And I would be sure to just uh, make sure you're, you don't have something like an idiopathic uh, low platelet count. And that could easily be discerned by a hematologist. And, uh, uh, and perhaps it would be one form and not the other of the octreotide. If they can't come up with anything and it's still dropping, uh, then I would would stop the form of somatostatin that you're taking. If it's octreotide LAR, maybe switch over to lanreotide or vice versa, because they don't always uh, they don't always behave the same. Especially, but platelets are that that is somewhat nerve wracking. And uh, I, but I would try and get a uh, uh, at least a, 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 the as best a diagnosis as you can. It may be completely unrelated. On the other hand, it it, it might be related. It's really remotely rare uh, for the uh, somatostatin analogs to do that. But it has been reported in the early early literature where they were giving pounds of this stuff, uh, you know, uh, to test the toxicity of it. So uh, it's an excellent question, but I my my suggestion would be to to seek out have your uh, primary care doc help you with a, a, a hematologist. You know, most uh, medical oncologists are trained in hematology, but they have different emphasis of their practice, and he would he or she would probably know which one. But I certainly would uh, have it looked into. Got it. Great Thank question. You. Absolutely. Hey, you know how our, our uh, audience does. They are well informed, well educated, and they 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 prompt you with thought provoking questions. Always, you, you said this thing at the beginning of that one. You're like, that's a good question, and like most difficult, right? And most good questions are difficult to answer, right? It's not as easy. As just... Well, that's what I used to say. A bad question is one I can't answer, but I can't say that anymore because it keeps coming up. Yeah, well, it's it's tough. I mean, that's the that's um that's the it's great. Yeah, and that's how I mean, we make it forward. It's absolutely great, Be yeah. you know, because uh, folks are so very well informed and knowledgeable. It's just wonderful. Well, and there's also, it seems to be, and this is a generalized statement, not one size fits all. That's the why the importance of having the multidisciplinary team, right? Because there's typically and not just key. one answer, you know, to, to these questions. It's a complex disease, and the questions that come along with it are going to be complex too. Yeah, absolutely. No, excellent. That's an excellent point, Ray. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so next question from Julie. Julie says, if you have an SI primary removed, but there is spread to the lungs, are you now considered a lung net? This is an interesting question. Or is that term just used if the lung uh, is a primary tumor? So that, that's also an excellent question. And we've seen, uh, well, I, I, can, I can share, I, I have cared for uh, two patients that I know uh, and worked with uh, that both had small bowel uh, neuroendocrine tumors that jumped the liver and, and went to the lung, okay? In which case that would be a metastasis from the small bowel to, to the lung. Now, if that were a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor and it showed up in the lung, that then needs to be determined histologically because we've seen a secondary, or what they call a secondary primary, which is another neuroendocrine tumor from the lung be associated with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors from the, from the pancreas. 
So that would be two, two neuroendocrine tumors, but from different origins. And that would be a pancreatic for the most part. I do not recall, it, I do recall as well, and Dr. Howe and I have had four patients where their small bowel went to the uh, uh, metastasized, but didn't metastasize to the pancreas. And at surgery, it was a different neuroendocrine tumor. So small bowel, uh, which normally can metastasize to the pancreas and most often to the liver, uh, can, can be a secondary tumor primary, just as you suggest. I'm trying to think if I know of a primary lung from a small, with a, associated with a small bowel, mm -hmm. and I don't believe I've seen that. Uh, I want to say that there was a, a, a small bowel about six months ago that did develop a uh, right lower lung uh, tumor, uh, but I, that was metastatic by staining from the from the lung, uh, from the small bowel. But as, uh, you're asking a good question: is how do you determine that? You, you know, you'd say well, automatically, well, it's metastasized from the small bowel to the lung, but sometimes that's not always true. And like you suggest, it should be, it might need to be biopsied, especially if it jumps the liver. Usually it'll go to the liver first and then the lung. But when you see something like you're describing where it went from your small bowel to the lung, then that does raise the question as to whether you might have a different neuroendocrine tumor there. So, uh, you know, on, on the other hand, maybe they're not seeing it in the liver because there's too small and something like that. But in general, they go to the liver first and then the lung. But we've also seen, as you described, small bowel to the lung. Got it. Thank you. Moving on. Next question from Florian, our friend from Germany. Hey, Florian. Hi, Dr. Odo and Rain. My question is, can secondary hyperparathyroidism also be present if the parathyroid hormone is elevated, but calcium and vitamin D uh, numbers are normal? And can MEN1 only be present in primary hyperparathyroidism? Oh, that's a, that's a terrific question. Um, I, I believe that the, let's start first with, when you're talking about MEN1 and hyperpara, you said it correctly. It's not one gland only. The, you know, the Lord's given us four parathyroid glands and people who get high calcium and high PTH normally have one of the glands involved with an adenoma. But when you're in the hyperpara associated MEN1, all four glands are involved. Now, your question is a, is a very good one. What happens when you have a high PTH in the setting of a parathyroid, of a, in the setting of an MEN1? Can it be secondary form? Uh, and I would say to you, uh, it depends, I think, in part on if there's any kidney damage. You know, if there is kidney damage, it's possible that uh, this, the secondary hyperpara may have developed because of the loss of calcium through the kidney. But you're asking if MEN1 and secondary hyperpara can coexist. And uh, like I say, there has to be a reason when you talk about secondary hyperpara as to whether there's some bowel disease and absorptive problem or some severe kidney disease. In general, I would say it, the, the what looks like secondary hyperpara in an MEN1 setting may be evolutionary as you go forward in, and that in a time span, the high calcium would then start to show itself. So I would say probably the association in order to call, making sure you have an MEN1, I mean, uh, before you, you know, it, because in general, MEN1, the first gland to be involved is the parathyroid gland in general. 
but I would say most likely the vast majority of the MEN1 associated hyperparas are primary, hyperplasia, mm -hmm. hypercalcemia, high PTH. Great Got question, it. but yeah. I think you have to give me or uh, have to see seek a cause. If, it, as you said, the PTH is high, but the calcium is low, it may well be independent and the person may not have enough vitamin D, in which case then they create this low calcium problem and the PTH is responding in a normal fashion to bring, to make more calcium. Got it. Thanks, Dr. Andresio. And thanks, Florian. Good to, uh, to see you back. Yeah, on great the question. Program. Um, all right, next question from Sally and seemingly many other people. Uh, Sally says, any clinical trials to examine the relationship between carcinoid and loss of memory? Now, first of all, let's establish that. Is that a common symptom? It seems like people experience that from the amount of people that like that. And then if so, any new development, developments, any clinical trials specifically? You know, that's also a terrific question. I mean, in, in my practice, uh, you, we, I use sort of a, uh, a sheet. I have a sheet of check off things for symptoms. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the things that's, uh, in there is, um, uh, memory issues Got it. and, uh, almost always, uh, it's, it's frequently checked off. And there's so much involved with that, as you know, I mean, folks could have a, an underlying, uh, you know, anxiety perhaps, or, or, you know, just the fact that they're suffering from a chronic illness sure. that can cause that, that, that type of, uh, of memory lapse or uh, from concentration difficulties and that sort of thing. I'm not aware of actual clinical trials, but uh, you can check that out uh, by uh, going to clinicaltrials.gov on your on your computer and it punches up every uh, approved clinical trial in the United States. And I think they've started adding European trials that are approved in, at a, in a special section. But you can easily go down that list with a query about, about uh, trials. Um, uh, I know uh, that uh, the University of Iowa has a, uh, we do a screen test or the psychiatrists have a screening test for depression, if you will, or something like or something akin to it. And if that score is a certain number, uh, they interview the patient, which is just great. That it all happens in the clinic. And I can't help but believe that also obtains with other centers, neuroendocrine tumor centers. But um, you know, in terms of the serotonin being the culprit in that case, and that's always been raised. I mean, you remember your serotonin you have is in the emotion center of the brain and in your body when you have the tumor, it circulates. And they always say the two are distinct. There are two compartments that don't interact. And that may not be true. There may be some, some uh, so, uh, there may be an issue where a lot of serotonin circulating below your neck can somehow get across the blood brain, blood brain barrier and, and cause an issue. So that, that's not completely excluded as a, as a problem for, for uh, uh, memory either. And those are, those are really in the hands of the psychologist, clinical psychologist and, and the psychiatrist but it's also a biochemical phenomenon. And so they, uh, in known cases of carcinoid, they, they are checking the serotonins for sure. Great question. And the, the answer is yes, I've observed it many times, uh, you know, and, and I think there's so much involved with what that could be, you know, what the causes could be. But I would check clinicaltrials.gov because you're yep. obviously keen on it, and I think you'll find an answer. Yeah, I, that, I plus one to that website, uh, and I've used it because we made a video about it a, a year or two ago about clinical mm -hmm. trials, rather. And uh, it's really uh, it's, it, 
it's uh, very effective. I mean, you can look at it state by state, region by region, but it's got everything that 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 uh, every that every clinical study that goes through yep. the process of the institutional review board because mm -hmm. that's critical. Mm -hmm. The university has to approve it as a safe uh, pro as a safe trial. It's a great resource, and absolutely. Yes, it is. Uh, Karen says, what test do you think is best? This comes up a lot too. What test do you think is best for serotonin, blood or 24-hour urine? Well, very, very good. I think blood uh, because it's direct. Uh, and that couldn't be said uh, 10 years ago because the difficulty with collecting serotonin in whole blood or plasma is that they used to take it out of the patient's arm and then they'd leave it sit on the tabletop before they <coughs> processed it. Mm -hmm. And serotonin has a very short half-life, believe it or not. It's probably 35, 40 seconds at the most. Wow. So half of it's gone in 30 seconds. Um, but a uh, person, I think I want to give credit to ARUP Labs, because I think that's where the, the technique was mastered. They said uh, through the process, they started adding ascorbic acid to the tube. And ascorbic acid stabilizes serotonin almost forever. I mean, it's remarkable. And there are at least five labs in the country that can measure serotonin. 5-HIA in the urine is, and the reason five, it's called 5-hydroxyindole acetic acid, is the breakdown product of serotonin. So when serotonin breaks down, it makes primarily the 5-HIA, and you have to collect it almost before the 24 hours. Uh, so you get a complete volume. But, you know, it's lugging a jug, if you will, for 24 hours. And that's also available. The 5-HIA can be measured in plasma, by the by. There's, and there's... Uh, at least one lab in science institute uh, measures it uh, in the blood. But I, I think the serotonin, and it's very variable, but it, it has given us information. We, co we collect it on every patient, on every visit. And uh, Dr. Howe has shown that if serotonin jumps, let's say two times uh, higher than it normally does, and let me just say that serotonin levels from month to month are very consistent. They don't vary that much. So a jump in a, at a clinic visit might herald new new tumor. But we uh, we we do a lot with serotonin. Uh, a lot of people do not because they think it's so variable, and it is affected. I mean, by the five E's: emotion, exercise, excitement, uh, eating, ethanol. All the E's decongestants of ephedrine can stimulate uh, serotonin within a serotonin uh, producing tumor. So they say, well, it's, it's too variable. Clearly 5-HIA is, whereas its usefulness is in helping assess the tumor burden in the liver. I shouldn't, uh, you know, discard it with the, with the bath water, uh, but, uh, but since it can be measured now in the plasma, which correlates very well with the urine 5-HIA, it's a simple blood test. And it, its correlation is like 0.88 against a 24-hour collection. And it's much more convenient for you to get it. And there's at least, I know of the lab at Inner Science Institute, and I think there's at least one other, and I, I'm not sure if it's, um, if it's Quest or not, but uh, uh, you could, that's an easy find for your lab. But I would do, if, if you're interested in that, and remember, 5-HIA will not jump until you have about 25% of a small bowel tumor, in, tumor burden in your liver. And that's what the problem's always been in the, the, uh, the value of the 5-HIA in the urine and what it really means. But it usually takes about 25% tumor burden before you can get a really good handle on liver tumor burden. And 5-HIA is very good for that. All right. Thanks for your question. question. Moving on, folks, we got about 10 minutes left. I know you all have a lot of questions and these mm -hmm. hours go by quickly. We're going to keep plugging along. Barney says, if a person is symptomatic for over 20 years, is it then properly, no, is then properly diagnosed and has a mid-gut 
liver tumor removed, gets a clean scan, but is still symptomatic after a year and a half. At this point, what test would you recommend? So there, uh, probably uh, very much so, uh, and thank you for the question. I, I think I would go, it's possible that they're not producing much serotonin, but I would, I would do a serotonin and a chromogranin A and a pancreastatin. Now, remember, pancreatin is just a small piece of the chromogranin A, but it's 100 times more sensitive for change than in, is the chromogranin A. You, and uh, there's, there's two labs in the United States. There used to be three, but there are two labs that do the pancreastatin, and that would be the uh, Agilitics from Boston, uh, ISI from California, uh, uh, Ohio State used to do it. They're no longer doing it. So those two commercial labs can do it. But I think I would start a steady with what you just said. I would do those regularly and serially. That's get a baseline chromogranin A, a pancreastatin, which will show you activity in the liver when it uh, when it's high when it jumps, and a serotonin to tell you, you know what your real level is. Got it. Great uh, question. Absolutely. Aren't they all? Kathy they said, all are. Kathy says, hello, all. I had rectal polyps removed over 20 years ago, and I was exhibiting flushing and carcinoid syndrome. What are the chances that it will, ret it will return after removal? And uh, I do have a small lesion on my liver found in 2017, but doctor said at the time, nonspecific. And she's just saying any advice would be appreciated at this point. Let me know if you need anything repeated, Doc Odo. Well, okay, so I, I'd say uh, it doesn't sound like now you're having symptoms. Uh, and if you are having symptoms that suggest the same thing be, as before, uh, I, would, I would be sure to try give a trial of octreotide mm -hmm. or lanreotide uh, mm -hmm. to see if it takes care of them. I would say that uh, they will remove the polyps. In general, most of those carcinoids of the rectum are very small, but if it was two centimeters or more, it should be followed at least yearly. And it sounds like even though you had multiple polyps, they, they associated with carcinoid, rectal carcinoids, sounds like they were under a centimeter uh, and that they were removed completely and that's it. And usually they do a CT scan initially to see if the lymph nodes are involved. So I would say if, um, if you're not having symptoms that were associated with the polyps and the polyps were removed, I would say that's a low probability. But if the size of the original rectal carcinoid was greater than, I would say even one and a half centimeters, but two centimeters is the cutoff, then they, they, you should be uh, regularly... Um, followed maybe every year or two years with a colonoscopy. And it would not hurt to make sure you've had at least one gallium scan, gallium dotatate, the net spot. Thanks, Kathy. I hope that helps. Uh, good luck to you. Next question from Ileana. Do you have any experience in the myocardial tumors uh, and how they interfere with the heart function of net patients specifically. I have not found much information in, in my literature about that. The, yeah, there, there isn't, and it's a great question. And yes, we have, and so is Bob Jensen at the National Institute of Health. And it seems to me that he reported nine, uh, they might've been gastronoma tumor patients who had uh, involvement of their myocardium. In terms of, it, oh, and the other one uh, to look up is, um, one second, I'll think of his name, uh, from uh, the Royal Academy uh, in, uh, in London, um, in Martin Kaplan, M-A-R-T-Y-N Kaplan, K-A, I think it's K-A-P-L-A-N, Martin Kaplan, Royal, uh, uh, Royal Hospital. And they, they've published, I think, a series of uh, cardiac-involved uh, neuroendocrine tumors. We've had several. Uh, the rhythm has not been an issue. They, they do not get close to the electrical bundle 
that would cause the heart to be in arrhythmia in our experience. Uh, but, um, uh, and I've, we've seen large ones and we've seen some of them grow. Clearly they respond to uh, PRT if they have the receptors, but our experience has been, we follow them and note them. Uh, I'm not aware of anybody using external radiation on the heart that would be way too dangerous, I would think and hurting the heart but uh, and i'm not aware that they've been removed either so they do hit the myocardium they usually aren't uh, clinically symptomatic uh, and they can be followed and they respond as well to octreotide analogs somatostatin analogs but uh, martin kaplan from london and uh, robert jensen J-E-N-S-E-N, -E uh, both have published on, on uh, tumors that uh, neuroendocrine tumors that go to the heart. Got it. Thanks for your question. Time for just a couple of more from Brenda, a top fan of the foundation. Is pancreatic atrophy something to watch from a neuroendocrine perspective? I do not consume alcohol and was recently noted in imaging. That's an excellent question. You know, mechanically... Uh, you can get some atrophy distal. That is, if you look at proximal being the head of the pancreas is on, touching the intestine and the tail of the pancreas is away, it uh, goes to your left, to the side, toward the side. Uh, you can sometimes see uh, little neuroendocrine tumors blocking and in leading to atrophy, but usually those are painful because they swell a duct and you, that'll bring clinical attention to it. Otherwise, they may be independent. Uh, it's not a cause and effect necessarily because neuroendocrine tumors don't get very big. They do get a little bigger in the pancreas than they do in the small bowel uh, because they're, they're asymptomatic more often than not. You don't feel, a, you don't have symptoms necessarily with the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Um, but that's not that's not necessarily a cause and effect. Uh, but if there is a blockage of the duct that carries the enzymes to the bowel, that's very painful, and usually is calls attention to something going on in the pancreas. But in general, you don't see that. A lot of times they're found serendipitously when they're looking for something else, and they'll see a tumor, a neuroendocrine tumor, and Got it's it. not usually associated with pancreatic atrophy. Like you said, there are other things that can happen. They can attack your pancreas, you know, in an autoimmune fashion, which mm -hmm. can, because the pancreas is made up mostly of exocrine, it's made up to help you with a meal. 95% of it is the juices that help digest food. About less than 5% are the hormone related mm -hmm. uh, function of the pancreas. Thanks, Brenda. Appreciate your question. Next question from Rebecca. Hey, everyone. What causes us net patients to have enlarged liver? And does it always mean metastases to, to liver? My liver went, is 21 for my CT scan done yesterday. And the normal liver size for a woman is 7.5. Should I be concerned? I would say uh, only if it's changed. If that's your first CT scan, then I think it, and there's no tumor in it that they can see grossly by CT. That would certainly be independent. You then turning it around, you can see enlargement of the liver when there's a lot of small metastasis from neuroendocrine tumors. But in general, uh, that phenomena of an enlarged liver with neuroendocrine tumors is not as frequent as just a liver, a, a, a normal sized liver uh, associated with, um, with neuroendocrine tumors. So that's not a one-to-one -one as you, as you uh, worry about. Um, you know, there are other causes for enlarged liver. You can get fatty liver, if you will, or, uh, you know, other issues primarily involving the liver or maybe the liver and parenchyma, the normal. So obviously, is, is there an associated tumor burden? That's, that's a, that, that makes it more causal. 
for a larger liver, but they don't seem to be that frequent. Got it, got it. Well, folks, that is our show for today. Uh, I just want to send a, a reminder because, uh, again, we had a ton of questions. We won't get to them all. And I saw some a couple of people say or ask a question again or mention that a question might have been missed. Missed. I just want to reiterate, if we don't get to your question or if you have a follow-up question that an answer created in your head, please, I urge you to reach out to CCF. Say we will continue this mission after the show. Uh, ends today and every week. So that is their job. If you send them your question, they will help you get the answer to that. We can't get yeah. to all of them each day. We try to. That's why I have that upvoting system. You know, it helps in the beginning. Um, so I, that's why I always reiterate, hey, send, send a message to CCF. They will help get you the answer. Yeah. And, and Rain, I would say, I don't know your process that well, but uh, you know, if you, if you triage or screen a question, I'm most happy to answer it by email. So there you go, folks. I mean, and most of our mm -hmm. experts are uh, make themselves available to you. So Dr. Dr. Odoricio just uh, just pledged that to you. So don't give up. You know, if you don't get your question answered, don't stop asking it. Even in the yeah. same program, if I didn't hit it the first time around, because I don't necessarily see it in the order that you send it, send it again. We'll try to get to it. OK, thanks so much. And Dr. Odoricio, thank you for coming back to the show. Clearly, you have pleasure. a big fan base. Um, oh, thank you. And it's probably because you're really good at what you do. So well, we appreciate I, it. I appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation again. I, I, I wish everybody peace. Thank Absolutely. You. And thanks to you all at home, as always. We hope this program helped answer some of your question. Again, reach out to the Carcinoid uh, Cancer Foundation, either here on their Facebook page or carcinoid.org. You can email them and they'll get you the answer to your question. Thanks, as always, to our presenting sponsor, Tercera Therapeutics. We could not do this program without them. And finally, my name is Rain Bennett. I have been your host. I appreciate you watching. Uh, in a couple of hours, I'm going to go speak to about 500 realtors so about telling their story. So wish me luck. And please Great join us. <laughs> Thanks. Please join us next time on Lunch with the Experts. Stay healthy. Stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye.